Hi friends, welcome back to the channel. This is the Prepared Suburbanite. And I wanted to talk to you about, I guess, a, a rather personal um, issue that I've had to deal with for probably the last 20 years or so. And uh, I'm losing my hearing. And I've uh, spent quite a lot of time trying to figure out, and quite a lot of money, trying to figure out how to mitigate my hearing loss. So stick around, I'll uh, get into some history and some stories and uh, some personal issues with regard to my hearing loss. About 20 years ago, I uh, found myself um, flying back and forth from uh, here in Wake County to Washington, D.C. to uh, work on a contract that my employer uh, was able to secure with, uh, within the District of Columbia. It was uh, quite a challenge, but the D.C. that well, I knew 20 years ago certainly is not the same D.C. that we know today. But I was forced to fly um, twice a week, um, fly out Monday morning and fly back Tuesday afternoon and then return on Thursday morning and uh, back on uh, Friday uh, afternoon. So it was uh, four trips um, from here in uh, Wake County at the RDU airport and I always had to go through uh, some other stop somewhere. Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, someplace. So I was, I was gaining all kinds of wonderful uh, frequent flyer miles on U.S. Air at the time. And uh, um, I, somewhere along the line, I caught a head cold. And that head cold really uh, uh, did me in. Uh, my, uh, my ears plugged up to the point where uh, it was painful to fly. Once you got above uh, uh, 9,000, 10,000 feet, I could feel that pressure change and pressing on my eardrums, and it was actually pretty painful. And I think I did quite a lot of damage to uh, my ability to hear. And uh, there were meetings that I was in. Thank God my assistant was... Uh, savvy enough to really understand what was going on and she'd basically interpret for me what was going on because I couldn't hear folks that were sitting around the conference table or sitting in a, um, a presentation room somewhere. Um, I, could, I could talk okay, but I couldn't hear um, any of the stuff. So she'd um, let me know that there was a question and say, hey, repeat the question, and she would, and um, so I addressed the question, and somehow we struggled through that, and uh, once I was able to take a short break from that, I was able to go uh, speak with an audiologist. Her name was Polly, P-O-L-L-Y, and uh, I think her real name was Pauline, but she preferred Polly. And uh, I sat in one of those little soundproof booths and had the ear sets on and um, she played sounds and this and that and I'd acknowledge if I could hear it and she'd turn it up or turn it down and I'd acknowledge or not. And uh, after, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes of sitting in the soundproof booth, I would... Uh, um, she, she came and knocked on the thing and said, okay, come on, and sat down with the results of my hearing test. And she said, you've got two issues going on. Uh, one is uh, genetic, something that you inherited uh, from someone in your family, your father, your grandfather, somebody. And uh, I, I, I believe that's true. And that that deficit that was hereditary um, affected the, um, the, the voice uh, area in the uh, whole scheme of things. And what, what would happen is um, what, what I'd hear 
was muffled noise. Sometimes I could make out um, individual words and I'd try to put the words together to see if I could figure out what the uh, conversation was about. And uh, so then she went on to say, you, you've got a secondary where you've had some, uh, uh, some ex damage to your ability to hear the eardrums or whatever. And um, th there's been some significant damage there. And what that does is um, um, turn down your ability to hear um, high-pitched noises, electronic beeps, that kind of a thing. Um, so you've got two things going on, and uh, they don't work uh, complementary with each other. And she said, let me try to explain um, what, what happens when you're faced with a hearing deficit like this. She said, in your brain, you've got a number of uh, reference manuals or books. And if you're uh, standing in a crowd, um, say you're at a cocktail party or um, uh, standing in uh, the church foyer before service and you're, you're chatting with folks and s some folks are talking about um, yesterday's college football games. And, um, so you, you reach up in your mind and you pull down your reference book on college football and you open it up and there it is. So as you hear certain words and phrases that come together, if you can discern some of the logic there, you'll reference that uh, reference manual and try to figure out exactly what's going on and should allow you to come up with some kind of a response that makes somewhat um, sense or at least contribute to the conversation. And uh, so she said, um, as, as the conversations go along, it can certainly rapidly change from yesterday's uh, uh, college football games to um, whatever the next subject might be. Let's say it's uh, um, today's um, church sermon about, um, you name it, uh, pick, pick a book of the Bible and uh, do it that way. So you can kind of figure out, okay, the, the subject has changed, and so I got to put my reference book on college football back in my brain and reach up and get my uh, Bible study book out. Uh, reference book and as you listen to, to hear what's going on and you hear people talking about uh, uh, today's sermon's going to be about the book of Daniel or whatever and uh, so you flip through your book and you try to find the book of Daniel chapter in your reference manual and you try to follow along and you try to piece things together and uh, snippets of individual conversations and this and that and uh, it should allow you to make a uh, uh, meaningful contribution to that particular conversation. But that goes on all the time whenever you're in a situation where you've got a hearing deficit and um, you're in a mixed group of people, acoustics are terrible, can't really hear exactly what's going on, and all you can do is pick up bits and phrases of uh, the conversation and try to follow along. Well, um, it's inevitable that it happens that they could be talking about something that you think you understand and you think it's time to interject a meaningful comment only to find out that you missed the subject by a mile. They could be talking about the book of Daniel. They could be talking about college football games. And uh, you say something that doesn't have anything to do with the topic at hand. And people look at you like, what are you doing? Uh, I'm sorry. The other um, devastating thing that I've uh, uh, noticed with that is that when I can't hear clearly or when I can't discern um, specifically, if someone is talking 
or if it's just some background noise. Um, I have a tendency in my hearing deficit to basically discount that or ignore it. And I may ask a question or start a conversation or interject something in there and people say, don't interrupt. He was talking. So, you know, please be, please be aware. And it's like, oh, sorry. So then what, what happens is you, you kind of shut down and you don't get into any kind of response um, at all with respect to the conversation. And you just kind of put the shell around you and say, well, I'm not going to embarrass myself any longer. So uh, Polly suggested after we went through her uh, uh, meaningful, and it was truly eye-opening and meaningful because I could actually picture myself reaching up for those reference books. Uh, she said, you're going to need hearing aids. And she went through the whole uh, um, gamut of uh, what was available through uh, her office and uh, her um, ENT doctor that she worked for. And um, so we ordered a, uh, a pair of um, inside the ear um, hearing aids, the, the little buds that kind of fit in your ears, uh, battery powered kind of things, but man, they were expensive. They were $4,000. But I figured, well, you know, I've, I've got a, a job to do. I've got a career. I've got to continue earning money and all that so that I can, I can live properly and take care of myself and my family. So um, I invested and we uh, uh, picked them up uh, uh, probably a month later and uh, she put them in and did some testing and did some adjusting and this and that and uh, I said well it sounds flat uh, there isn't any depth uh, in in that and she said well, what do you mean she said well I can't tell where the uh, uh, where the noise is coming from and so she walked around the room and banged um, uh, 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 spoon up against a coffee cup and so it made a noise and I could I could actually follow it around so um, it was just that improved sense of sound coming in that I could finally adjust to okay now I know where it's coming from it was a lot louder and um, it was a lot more clear what people were saying so they seemed to work for um, quite a while and uh, as technology grows, they, uh, um, and technology is the way technology is, about two years later, that $4,000 investment basically quit working. And uh, so I took the hearing aids back to Polly, and she said, oh, yeah, well, I see what's going on here. Uh, we'll have to send them out to get refurbished and uh, do that. So remeasured and uh, redid the earbud fitting and stuff like that and uh, came back with a set of refitted and that cost a thousand dollars to get those refitted and they lasted for a couple more years and then all of a sudden Polly was gone she retired went on her merry way uh, wherever she went and there I was kind of stuck in the wilderness uh, trying to figure out what was going on. And the darn things um, weren't, they were acting up, uh, I guess. So sometimes uh, one of them would work and the other times the other one would work, but it was rare that they both worked at the same time. So I found a different audiology group um, that serviced that same brand of hearing aids and took them in there he spent um, probably, and I can't remember the kid's name, but he was very good. He spent uh, probably a half an hour on the telephone with the company trying to uh, uh, get what was going on with these. Like, we'd go through a whole reset process, um, retune everything, and uh, 10 minutes later, it would just default back to 
um, this this flat line kind of a thing where they only work part of the time and all that. So back and forth he went, finally figured out what uh, setting he needed to adjust to get it to uh, accept the changes that were necessary for me to actually hear something using those hearing aids. And uh, so as time goes by, <laughs> um, those finally failed and I picked up, um, uh, had to go pick up a second set of hearing aids and we uh, uh, did basically the same kind. Um, the next um, technology version was uh, somewhat of an improvement and they worked for another couple of years and they finally bit the dust. So um, there I was, I got uh, probably ten or eleven thousand dollars invested in two sets of hearing aids and neither one of them worked um, after so many years. So it's probably six, seven years total. So my wife was shopping around and found um, one of these like off the, uh, off the beaten path kind of things. And th these were the kind of hearing aids that fit behind the ear and the battery packs there and this little wire uh, plastic tube comes down and plugs into your ears. And they seem to work uh, pretty good, but they're not as adjustable as the $4,000 or $5,000 high-tech ones. Uh, you could adjust them a little bit. You could increase the volume or decrease the volume. And they had settings for um, being in a, a closed room versus in an auditorium and that kind of stuff. Well, um, they work for a short period of time. And... <laughs> um, my, my, uh, my, my hearing deficit continued to actually get worse. So every time I'd get tested, the, um, the graph that they show me would change. And it would change a little bit, uh, telling me that, uh, and telling the audiologist that um, my hearing continues to degrade. And it will, uh, because there was such damage uh, to the, uh, my ability to hear based on the damage and based on the hereditary factors. Um, my, I remember my granddad had uh, um, hearing aids <laughs> and uh, he hated them. But that was, uh, that's where I think I got uh, the hereditary part was from my maternal grandfather and uh, that's just kind of the way it goes. So of late, the um, my hearing continues to decline. It uh, continues to give me fits. Um, I, I have to stop and ask folks to repeat themselves on a frequent basis. Um, I can't hear um, the the birds in the backyard. My wife says, "Oh, did you hear that dog barking? No. Oh, did you hear that owl hoot? No." Do you hear the kids playing across the way? No. In fact, I didn't even realize until I got that first set of hearing aids that when the wind blew, the leaves kind of banged together and made noise. Um, I had never experienced that in my entire life. So um, I, I was able to hear that uh, for a short period of time, but today, um, just it doesn't happen. So what can you do? Um, take good care of your ears, I guess. Uh, make sure that you uh, visit a good audiologist from time to time if you're suffering from uh, hearing loss or any kind of degradation in your hearing. And uh, um, try to follow along. The um, over-the-counter uh, hearing aids of today are probably at least equivalent to what was available uh, 10 plus years ago uh, with the high-tech stuff. Well, the over-the-counter stuff seems to work, and they're only about four or five hundred dollars now, and some of them are even cheaper than that. So it's time for me again to invest in another um, set of hearing aids so that I can continue to marginally function in a world that is uh, uh, hearing-oriented, I believe. Every conversation, uh, all that kind of stuff, I've got. Um, 
Bluetooth speakers all over the house so that if I'm watching TV, I can uh, turn those things way up and, and actually hear what's going on. And my wife keeps coming over and turning them all down. Um, so it's just kind of one of those things. In fact, she's my uh, uh, sound person uh, when I do these kind of videos because I can never tell if I'm talking too loud, if the, the video or the audio gain is at the right level for you all. So I'll, uh, while we're editing, I'll call her into the room and say, does it sound good? Does it sound too loud? Does it sound too soft? Because I can't barely pick it out. Anyway, um, that's my story. It's uh, um, one of those things that I think you just have to learn to live with over time. You can do a little bit to mitigate some of the issues with uh, today's um, hearing aid technology. And uh, we'll have to see what the next step is. This is the Prepared Suburbanite reminding you to be prepared always. And I'll see you all on the next video.